So I learned in the jewelry business how to sell. And I got to tell you, but that's one of the best experiences I ever had. Because as I say, in tech, you're either making it or selling it. And so I right. learned how to sell, which helped me in my evangelistic efforts for the rest of my life. Here are some lessons. So first of all, it's a grind. Um, you, you have got to be willing to deal with rejection. When you call on some of these famous retailers, if they're making you sit in the outside waiting for the appointment for an hour <laughs> or two hours, that's just the way it is. So I don't care who you are. Uh, sales, you've got to be able to deal with rejection and abuse <laughs> and stuff like that. And I think that's a very good lesson that, you know, life is not a cake. Definitely. So that's one. Number Not everyone two says is, yes to you all the time. No, 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 no. You got to deal with rejection. Uh, uh, another is about building trust because honestly, at some level, almost everything is a commodity. Now, your commodity may be gold and diamonds, which is yeah more than, I don't know, crude salt. But at some level, 18 karat gold is 18 karat gold and a, you know, a one carat VVS colored, you know, whatever diamond is a diamond. And so it is about the personal relationships. So truly it is about personal relationships and selling. And it, it, and it helps you develop, I think, uh, a, a skill or you die of reading people, you know. Yeah. To some people, it's the quality. To some people, it's the design. To some people, it's the price. To some people, it's the terms of payment. You know, everybody has different needs. So I, I, I wish everybody had a stint in sales. I mean, even if you work at a burger joint, because it will serve you for the rest of Absolutely. your career. All right. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Jake Dunlap Show. We are very excited that you joined us. If you haven't tuned in, this is the show where we talk to celebrities, thought, and industry leaders to really discover their journey to success. I am super excited that you're joining us. This show is like no other. I can promise you that. You might laugh, you might cry, but you will definitely leave inspired and gain a whole new level of insight into those people that you follow, love, and admire. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of The Jake Dunlap Show. This is going to be a great one. Uh, this week's guest might be everyone's favorite Hawaiian outside of Barack Obama, maybe. Uh, he could have never in a million years predicted that he would work for Steve Jobs twice and definitely couldn't have pictured his shoes being shined by Sir Richard Branson. Before entrepreneurship was cool or everyone was an evangelist, right? This, this gentleman was the first one, right? And, and a quote that I saw as well is that he has made a massive dent in the universe. He's a world-renowned speaker on marketing, innovation, life. This is one of my favorite ones, and enchantment, which I want to know more about that. He's the host of the Remarkable People podcast, has 3 million plus followers on LinkedIn, 1.4 million on Twitter. And no matter where you find him, he is bringing the good news, which is Greek for evangelist, uh, to all of his followers and all of us daily. So please join me in welcoming the second most well-known evangelist behind God himself, Mr. Guy Kawasaki. Guy, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for that intro. Yeah, well, it's, it's a good one. I've, I've heard you talk a little bit about that, about the, well, I, the I, uh, constantly a, being behind God as the OG answer. evangelist. <laughs> well, so you know, so we there so we was talked Jesus before me. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I mean like hey, you got to play to your strengths. Tough act to follow. It's I'm, I'm really excited. Well, yeah, exactly. But hey, you're doing an alright job. You're making a dent as we've talked about. And so that's <laughs> what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the early days. Um, you know, you and I talked a little bit about this and I think um, what we love to do is tell the stories of, you know, how people you know, gain some of the skills or life attitude. And we find a lot of that happens early. And so for you, you know, grew up in Hawaii, uh, third generation, from what I understand. I know your, your father and mother had a big influence on you. So what was, you know, what was it like growing up in Hawaii? And this is Honolulu, you know, mid-50s, yeah. late-50s. 
you know, what was that like? You know, what, what are some big things that stand out in early sure. childhood? So I was born in 1954 and I come from a lower middle class family. Uh, where I lived in Hawaii was, you know, I, I wouldn't say it was the hood, but it, <laughs> it definitely wasn't the right side of town or the right side of the tracks. And very diverse, you know, Hawaiians, Filipinos, Samoans, very few white people, very few white people. <laughs> and, uh, and, but I, 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 if you're looking for that great story where this is someone who lifted himself out of poverty and crime and, you know, blah, 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 that's not <laughs> me. Um, my story yeah. is not that good. And, I had wonderful family, wonderful parents, and they sacrificed everything for me and my sister. Um, my father was a fireman. My mother was a housewife. So, you know, it, it, it wasn't like I grew up in Trump Tower, let's just say. And uh, But, you know, at the time, it's not like I thought I was poor. I just, that yeah, was just what it was, right? And I, I went to a public elementary school, and one of the big turning points in my life is that the sixth grade teacher told my parents that I had too much potential and to get me out of the public school system and put me in the college prep system, private school system. And my parents listened to her, sacrificed for years so I could go to a very expensive high school. That high school... I don't know how God in, intervened, but somehow somebody told me to apply to Stanford, and then God intervened twice, and I got into Stanford. And at Stanford, I met the guy who hired me at Apple, and the rest is history. So it's really about that elementary school teacher, the sacrifice of my parents, and you know, sort of being in the right place at the right time. And yeah, the universe tends to find the path for us. Uh, and it's really amazing, again, how, the, how those early stories, uh, there's one thing I, I picked up, you know, one of the things that your, your dad, I think, had said around, don't look for problems that don't exist. Growing up, again, your dad seems like, again, you, you, you recognize the sacrifices now. Um, you know, is it something that you were aware of then, just of like, wow, like my parents are really, you know, doing a lot for me? Or is it something that you had a chance you know, to reflect on later? You know... I, I suppose the politically optimal answer would be some soulful recollection that uh, even at the time I knew what great parents were and how they were making exactly. sacrifices, et cetera, et cetera. But that would be total unequivocal bullshit. So it's no only now that I am a parent that I can appreciate what my parents did. Right. At the time, you know... I was oblivious. I, I just wanted to play football. And so uh, I, I, this is one of those things that I think you have to look back on. Now, if I may digress a bit, can I tell the story about my father that you you alluded to so that people understand the context? Yes, digress. Okay. That's, all we do. That's pretty much all we do is just digress. So it's all <laughs> you're, you're, you're right in line with it. Yeah. Yeah, yesterday I interviewed Neil deGrasse Tyson, and that was just one long digression. Yeah, so exactly. Uh, so uh, towards the end of my career at Apple, I was living in. Excuse me. <laughs> at the start of my second career at Apple, I was living in San Francisco with my wife and and one child, um, and. We lived in a very nice part of San Francisco on Union Street, where Union dead ends into the Presidio. And yep, know where that one is. day I'm, I'm outside and I'm cutting a hedge in front of my house on Union Street. And an older white woman comes up to me and says, do you do lawns also? <laughs> I said to her, well, I'm Japanese, so you think I'm the yard man, right? She goes, no, 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 you're just doing such a great job. I just... Wanted to see if you also do lawns. So, you know, lesson number one is about racial profiling, right? Japanese must be a gardener. Now, there is a better story, though, that, you know, my father visited me a few weeks after that. And I fully expected him to tell me, after I told him this story, 
that, you know, who the hell does she think she is? How dare she think that you're the gardener just because you're Japanese? You know, we're right. third generation Japanese American, blah, blah, blah. But to my utter amazement, he told me, you know, guy, you know, son, where you live in San Francisco, Japanese man on the street cutting a hedge, statistically, you probably were the yard man. So get over it. Don't look for problems. Take the high road. Use humor. And so that, that was the day that it became very hard to offend me, arguably for the rest of my life. Now, subsequently, in the last decade or so, I've had another thought, which is maybe my father wasn't right. And maybe okay. confronting her was right to maybe educate her, to show her what she's doing, and that standing up to her and telling her that that's wrong and you should not do this may have been the optimal response. But for the first 55 years of my life, I thought that was a very valuable lesson. Yeah. I think that's a really, yeah, I think a lot more, I think as we, we understand the difference between not saying anything and not being a part of the problem, as opposed to, again, as a, a white male myself, right? Like, I think that that's a big part of this is about, you know, saying things at the right time. Not that the lesson at that, not, not that the lesson is not a good lesson. It just may not have been as applicable as, you know, well, well, in that also, scenario necessarily. Yeah. And certainly the times have changed since that happened. So anyway, <laughs> let's yeah, not lose definitely. too much sleep about that. <laughs> That's, well, again, like the lessons that we learned, they, they apply differently at different points in our life. <clears throat> let's put it yes, that way. Absolutely. And so I want to talk about Stanford. I want to talk about there, there's a, 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 a moment I, I kind of pulled out around when you were there and your roommate, uh, Mike Boish, I think is how you pronounce Boish, it, right? Boish. And that you went home with thank Boich, uh, you went home with him for Thanksgiving and that there was there was some moment there that, that you had that that shaped you. You got to drive a Ferrari, a Mercedes. OK, OK. So I go to Stanford and I come from this lower middle class part of Hawaii. And in Hawaii, you're considered at the time, you're considered really successful if you worked in the hotel business, the agricultural business, you managed a drugstore, you know, something like that. And I come to the mainland and the scales were removed from my eyes, right? There's these high tech firms and everybody's driving a German car. You have these magnificent houses that are not just made of, you know, half inch thick redwood planks. And so it's like, oh, my God. And, and I just happened to be set up with a roommate who came from a very wealthy family out of Arizona. So, you know, one year I go home with him and his father picks us up in a Rolls Royce. So, you know, going from a Toyota Corona to a Rolls Royce, that was quite the transition. So my head is exploding. I'm in a Rolls Royce. We go to his house. The backyard of his house is the golf course of the Arizona Biltmore. Again, my oh, head is exploding. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm having a hard time keeping all the little gray matter in my head because my head has exploded. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then we go out to dinner, and his mother asked me to drive her car home, and it's a Ferrari Daytona. So, you know, when you, I bet when you ask many of your guests, so what motivated you as a young person? You know, how did you set on this path? I bet a lot of them give really great answers. Like, I wanted to dent the universe. I wanted to change yeah, sure. the world. I wanted to um, end poverty. I wanted to end pollution and corruption, democratize, you know, I, yeah, yeah. to change the world. Well, I tell you something. When I wrote that Daytona, I said to myself, Guy, this is why you got to study hard. This is why you got to work hard because yeah. you want to drive a Ferrari or a Porsche. And so, whereas many people wanted to change the world, all I wanted to do was change the car. Yeah. Well, that, look, it's, it's, those are the things that motivate us. I talked to Neil Patel, <laughs> well, and he, he had, a, he had well, a similar story as well, too. Not a Ferrari, but something similar. Well, you know... Now, to, to, to 
make myself look slightly less <laughs> in, in materialistic. Stupid. But no, it's like, hey, it is what it is. I had, I had a very but, similar but, story but, growing but, up too. But there's, a, I, but there's a serious lesson here. And the serious lesson is that it does not matter what motivates you, whether it is changing the car, denting the universe, changing the world, ending poverty. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that you are motivated and you do something. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> the, the concept of, again, like waiting for your calling. Right. And I think a lot of times it's like you find your calling in the doing wherever those things, you know, may be. And so at Stanford, I, so psychology major, I understand that was the easiest major that they had at the time, Absolutely. which still at Stanford doesn't sound too easy. <laughs> um, and then you, and then the next step is law school, which I think you like talk, talk a little bit about that, right? Like, I think there's like, you know, parental, like I'm going to go try out law school at UC Davis. What would tell me a little bit about that week and what well, your, and what your takeaway was from that week? Well, the, you, gotta, you, you gotta remember that this is the mid seventies. So mid-70s, Asian-American, your parents wanted you to be a doctor, lawyer, or dentist. Certainly not an entrepreneur. And so I didn't want to be a doctor. As a matter of fact, when I went to Stanford, I took a, a course where you toured the Stanford Hospital for credit. And the first day I fainted. So I said, you know, probably <laughs> I'm not going to be a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> and then dentists, man, do you want to stick your hand in people's oh, mouths God. for the rest Sounds of your horrible. life? So the only thing left was being a lawyer. So I, I go to law school and my father was a legislator in Hawaii, state senator, but he did not have a college education. So his kind of dream was I go to college, get a law degree, you know, be a politician or something. And so I go to law school and I hated it. I mean, two weeks, I was like, the, it was totally intimidating. You know, they just want to tell you you're a piece of crap and I'm going to remake your mind. I could not handle that. My ego at that point was too fragile. I've subsequently re recovered from that condition. <laughs> but anyway. So, Dad was supportive, which is great. What was it about, you know, getting an MBA that you felt was like the next, the next step? Well... You know, we have to go back in time. So today, if you were to ask me about the value of an MBA, I would give you a very different story than what it was like back then. Sure. So today, an MBA is if you want to go to McKinsey or, you know, New York Investment Banking. And back then, it was the MBA was a fence or a hurdle for almost every management position. Today... You know, if you want to go to work for Google, you don't need an MBA. I mean, it might work against you totally. if you had an MBA. So back then, the thing to do was get an advanced degree, whether it was law or business. I definitely didn't want to be a lawyer, and I wanted to be in business. I wanted to be an entrepreneur, so I went to the, an MBA. And um, I, if people were to ask me advice today about an MBA, I would give them very different advice than you what know, would back you tell the, them? What would what, what well, would you say? Well, I, I would tell them if you want to go into a large company, a Procter and Gamble, consulting, investment banking, go get an MBA. But if you want to uh, uh, work in tech, I think in tech fundamentally there are only really two sort of functions, right? Somebody's got to make it. And somebody's got to sell it. And so you're not going to learn either of those two things getting an MBA. That's and, right. And so I don't know. But now every MBA officer <laughs> who listens to this podcast is going <laughs> to tell people not They're to They're like, oh, my it. gosh, he said no. I mean, look, yeah. and I, I, you know, I got my MBA after being in the professional world for a few yes. years and I was in, you know, grew up in sales and I grew up in sales. And for me, it was more about exposure. Like, wait, this is how finance thinks. This is how, you know, software engineers think and, and operations. Yeah. And but but again, like, but I didn't go back to check a box. I went back to actually, you know, because I didn't do I didn't pay attention at all in undergrad. And so, you know, I think for certain people, it's like I think what you're getting at is like if you're going to check a box, only do that if you're going to go here, right? Other than that, like do it for yourself. You know, that's my that's my take is you know do it for yep. your own learning. 
So you yep. graduate. And then obviously, I'm sure I'm sure when you graduate, you're like, you know what I want to do is get in the diamond and fine jewelry business. I'm sure that was like <laughs> life. I'm sure that was like life path. You're like, yeah, that's that's, that's the first thing I'm going to. That's the I first mean, real job a, here. So, well, that's a traditional path to get into tech. You know, you go into the diamond business. Kind of <laughs> exactly. So the story there is that while at UCLA, it was a four day a week program. And again, coming from a lower middle class family, it's not like the trust funds are rolling in every month. So I had right. to get a job. And I met a woman from Hawaii who worked in the jewelry business, and she gave me a job in downtown L.A., literally counting diamonds. So I counted diamonds on my day off, uh, the Friday of every week. And after I left, um, after I got my MBA, while my friends were going to banks and consulting firms, I went into a small family-owned jewelry manufacturer in downtown L.A., and I went into sales and marketing there, which sales and marketing in the jewelry business, it, it's not like today, you know, it's not like you're doing A, B tests between, well, should the link right. be blue or should right. it be green? And should we have a, an image here or there? It was hand-to-hand -hand combat calling on retail stores where they wanted to buy your jewelry for slightly above scrap value. And so I learned in the jewelry business how to sell and I got to tell you, but that's one of the best experiences I ever had, because as I say, um, anyway, in tech, you're either making it or selling it. And so I right. learned how to sell, which helped me in my evangelistic efforts for the rest of my life. What was I mean, when you think back, like what was the the biggest take? I mean, again, I've been in sales for you know 20 years and run a sales consulting firm. So a sales is a passion of mine. You know, what was it that you look back like? What was the skill or what was the the hurdle that you got over the uncomfortableness? Like when you look back, you know, some of the biggest lessons around, well, you know, well, starting of off biggest, in sales. Yeah. Some of the biggest lessons is. Well, here are some lessons. So first of all. It's a grind. Um, you, you have got to be willing to deal with rejection. When you call on some of these famous retailers, if they're making you sit in the outside waiting for the appointment for an hour <laughs> or two hours, that's just the way it is. So I don't care who you are. Uh, sales, you've got to be able to deal with rejection and abuse and stuff like that and i think that's a very good lesson that you know life is not a cake definitely walk. so that's one number not two everyone is, says yes to you all the time no 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 you got to deal with rejection uh, uh, another is about building trust because honestly at some level almost everything is a commodity now your commodity may be gold and diamonds, which is yeah more than, I don't know, crude salt. But at some level, 18 karat gold is 18 karat gold and a, you know, a one karat VVS colored, you know, whatever diamond is a diamond. And so it is about the personal relationships. So truly it is about personal relationships and selling. And it, and it helps you develop I think uh, uh, a skill or you die of reading people, you know, yeah. to some people it's the quality, to some people it's the design, to some people it's the price, to some people it's the terms of payment, you know, everybody has different needs. So I, I, I wish everybody had a stint in sales. I mean, even if you work at a burger joint, because it will serve you for the rest of your Absolutely. career. I love that. So you heard it here. Just try it. You know, people are daunted. I mean, again, it just, just gives you a whole new perspective on even how to shape things and messaging. And then obviously your next step, you know, you go, you get your first tech job. And this is early 80s, just for everyone kind of point of reference here at Edgyware. 
services. Um, you know, what was it about tech then? I mean, we're talking, this is, you know, the early days of what would become, <laughs> you know, the, you know, the Commodore and these other, you know, these other things, you know, yeah. what was it about tech that was, it was interesting for you that you, I know you had tried to break in for a little bit, but what was it that you felt yeah. kind of drawn to this? So, boy, your audience has to go back in time for this. So when I went to Stanford, and you had to do papers. The lucky people had a typewriter. The really lucky people had an IBM typewriter. The really, really, really lucky people had an IBM typewriter with the correcting tape. So you could Ooh, backspace. Yeah, I remember Ooh, that. I, you're, you're old <laughs> enough to remember that? I remember so the, that. You know, so the liftoff tape. Or you use the typist to type your papers. So that's what it was like. And, and in college, it's always a struggle to make the paper come out long enough, not short enough. So you use the biggest <laughs> typewriter ball and the most spacing and all that, right? And so that's the word I was coming from, typewriter, electric typewriter. And then somebody shows me an Apple II, Mike Boych, and it's got word processing, like, holy cow, you mean no more selectric typewriter, no more backspacing, lifting off tape? You can just, like, correct it? And uh, you know, word processing on an Apple II, it was the scales were removed from my eyes. I mean, OMG, what a concept. And so I saw that. And then I saw databases. So now instead of putting things on Rolodex cards, you know, you had quick file and then spreadsheet. Holy cow, what a tool. And it, it, was, it was a religious experience to see personal computing. And, and then the next step is Mike Boych shows me a Macintosh. And so if you went from an Apple II to a Macintosh, now there's a mouse. Now it's WYSIWYG display, WYSIWYG printing, integration of text and graphics, Mac Paint where you spray a design, you draw out a rectangle, you fill it with a, a fill. I mean, you know, not only were the scales removed from my yeah. eyes, I mean, I swear, like, you know, the, the angels started singing. I, I, the clouds parted. It was hallelujah. It was really, it was a religious experience for me to yeah. come to personal computing. Yeah. And, and so, again, like why, you know, what was it about? Again, so you go to a software organization and you get, you get into marketing. So that's kind of your first like what was, you know, what's the I guess the again, you, you've learning this. You're doing a little bit of this at the jewelry business. Um, and again, you go to to Eduware and then very quickly, you know, you go to Apple. as And was the first title software evangelist? Was that your first yes. title there? Yes. At Apple. So that was the first so, title. I mean, wow. Yeah, literally. So. The concept is that evangelism means bringing the good news. So my job was to bring the good news of Macintosh to developers. That Macintosh had a very rich development environment with lots of graphic routines in the ROM of the computer. You didn't have to roll your own. That we were opening up computing to a new market of people who could never use computers before. And we were giving you a hedge on your bet that if you only wrote IBM PC software, now you had a second horse just in case IBM PC software didn't work out. So my job was to bring the good news of Macintosh as an opportunity to software developers. And it, it was a great job. What are some of the big memories? I mean, you've talked about this before about, you know, the different interactions. One of the ones I pulled up is that you you gave Mark Benioff his first job there <laughs> at this stint. Is that right? That That is literally true. So Mark Benioff was this punk at USC freshman year. <laughs> and I gave him his first job, summer job, writing assembly language sample programs. And Mark Benioff, the punk from Hillsborough California became Mark Benioff, the executive at Oracle, who became Mark Benioff, the founder of Salesforce, who became Mark Benioff, the billionaire <laughs> power mogul. <laughs> I, I'm not taking any That's credit wild. for his success. <laughs> Your summer internship, but, just sitting him doing some coding. 
I, I am one for one with summer interns. I had one summer intern, and he turned into a billionaire. <laughs> and, and You're like, I'm, I'm done. Any, I'm not doing this. I'm like, I'm good. Yeah, I, it, I, I'm not going to have any more summer interns because it's going to ruin my record. It's nothing but downside there. Everybody wants to be your intern right now. Like everyone, everyone is going to reach out now. They're going to DM you on Insta or something. And well, be like, oh, but hey, but, but they should realize that the correlation is not the same as causation. <laughs> That's correct. That's correct. And so, and then eventually, you know, you leave after a few years to do your own thing. So this is really, you know, kind of your first called like entrepreneurial venture. You know, what was it about, I guess, going out on your own? You know, why was like that the time? You know, what was it that you kind of thought through and you're like, hey, like I'm ready to kind of break out on my own? Sure. Well, you know, I, I, I fell into the Silicon Valley magic, right? That two guys in a garage, right, two right. gals in a garage, guy and a gal in a garage. They have this great idea. They make it part time. Lo and behold, people love it. Then they start the next Apple or you know, Google or Pinterest or Facebook or whatever. Right. And um, that's in the air here. Now, honestly... I can't tell you that I'm, quote unquote, this highly successful entrepreneur. I started several software companies. At best, they were moderate successes. So let's just be honest here. I don't, I don't want to like reinvent history. So I, you know, yeah. I'm not the co-founder of Apple or Microsoft or Google or Cisco or anything like that. Uh, but I, I did start some moderately successful things. And, you know, fast forward till about seven years ago and Canva found me. So I didn't find Canva. Canva yeah. found me. And I've been with Canva for about seven years as chief evangelist. And Canva, oh, my God. I mean, Canva. Rocket is ship. I love proof. those guys. Yeah. Well, it's not just a rocket ship. It's like, you know, it's like all of Starlink's satellite rockets in one. I mean, it's <laughs> So right. 30,000 30, satellites or whatever. And so uh, Canva, Canva is just the greatest proof of what I call guy's golden touch. And guy's golden touch is not that <laughs> whatever I touch turns to gold. Guy's golden touch is whatever is gold, guy touches. And, um, you know, all credit, <laughs> all, all credit to Canva it. goes to Melanie Perkins, Cliff Obrick, That's and right. Cameron Adams, the three co-founders. And I, I, they found me. Lucky for me, the person helping me with social media told me to go help them. And I got on that, and it was a rocket ship, tsunami, hurricane, whatever metaphor you want to use. But... Um, and I learned one valuable lesson, which is it's better to be lucky than smart. <laughs> <laughs> but you put yourself in these situations where, where you're available. Actually, a good friend of mine, John Itell, is the, the head of sales there. I don't know if you had a chance to work with John before, but uh, we're big fans of Canva uh, here at Scaled as well, too. So um, it's just such a, an awesome story. And I think really Canva, at least for me, um, to digress a little bit, I feel like now, I mean, obviously everything is product-led growth now. Now, I mean, look, we've had waves of where everything was this back in like the Hotmail, Dropbox days. And now, you know, every tech company is product-led growth. But because they see what happens with Canva, right? Canva is like, we're just going to build a really amazing, easy-to-use product and make it very, and very, very easy to access. And not every product is set up to be a PLG company, but um, it's just been amazing to watch what's happened over the last, you know, five years yeah. in particular. And I can't imagine like having a and, front row and, seat to it. <laughs> and you know what, Jake? I'm going to say now that I absolutely knew this was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> of course, oh, of you course might, you did. Yeah. <laughs> now you, you might ask, well, what happened to all the other companies that you knew would be successful? <laughs> and and that's where you know the way it works in Silicon Valley is we throw a lot of stuff up against the wall. That's right. A very small number stick, and then we go up to the wall and we paint the bullseye around it, and we say, we hit the bullseye. That's, well, Jake, that's right. That Jake, one. Let's not pay attention to these other things. This one. 
<laughs> you can always hit the bullseye if you paint the target after you find out what's stuck. <laughs> that uh, that might be the title for the episode. I actually like that. You can always hit the bullseye <laughs> when you paint it after. You had some success. Stumble upon. There's some. You had some. There's there's quite a few of these that Not have like worked Canada. out. Yeah, well, yeah. That's that's a whole. That's like a you know generational type of growth. I mean, that's oh, amazing. But again, it's all these other things. I mean. Yeah, but I yeah. had Jake. Jake, Canva is a unicorn farting pixie dust. That's the only way I can describe <laughs> it. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Like, what's the, what's the, the dragon, the decacorn, right? The, I mean, it's all of the above. It's like its own category at this point. Yeah. You know, and it's really been, but it's all these things that like, obviously that you did. And, and I, you know, know, question for you is like, what, what, yeah. No, I, I was going to say that I think one of the lessons you can draw from many, many successes is to democratize something that was heretofore reserved for rich, powerful, or, you know, very dedicated use. So, in a sense, computers, mainframes and minis, it was for rich, powerful companies. Apple won, democratized computing. Canva. With Canva, if you want to design, you either became an illustrator and Photoshop expert or you hired an illustrator or photo op expert That's right. or Photoshop expert. Well, Canva democratized that. You didn't have to do that. And so I think if you look at many things... The, the democratization of something that was heretofore elite is a very good investment and entrepreneurial algorithm. Yeah, you've seen it time and time again. And it's, it's, yep. it's so interesting. There's obviously like a million things that you've done in between now and then. Um, like literally there's like a million. Like you should, like this sheet is, it's by far the longest sheet. Like, I, you know, like the prep is like, there's a million things. So we'll link to a lot of this too, just so if people are interested. But as we start to kind of wrap up here, there are some, you know, a couple of quick questions that I had to, to kind of go deep on is, you know, at what point did you, Recognize maybe this is the same, you know, like the power of, again, you've been doing this evangelist work for all these companies and raising your profile as a professional. You know, at what point did you see social media? At what point were you like, oh, like, and you've written, you know, a million books. Like, at what point were you like, I've got to get involved here? Like, was there, yeah. was there an aha well, moment that you had? Okay. A another opportunity to give you two versions. <laughs> so... <laughs> One version is, well, of course, as soon as I saw Twitter, I realized the power of social media and I immediately embraced it because I knew it was a new communications methodology that would change the world. You can believe that if you want. Really, what happened with Twitter is people started using it at South by Southwest. Yep. And so, so I go to Twitter.com and at that point, Twitter.com, you, you know, the, the front page was just people's random tweets that's right and i remember jay, jay i swear half the tweets were the line at starbucks is long that's right because <laughs> it was just the like contained at, there right <laughs> right my dog is sleeping the line at southwest airlines is long i just had a cup of coffee and and this is from tiffany in la lonely boy 15 you know, Jake <laughs> from kansas city and, and i'm looking yeah. at the twitter homepage, and i'm saying why do i give a shit if the line at starbucks kansas city is long like what the hell is the use for this and, and it's not until i started searching on twitter for mentions of products that i was competing with or you know, people I were, were interested in knowing what they're doing or, you know, stuff like that, that I saw a practical use for Twitter. And so the answer to your question is that um, my first reaction to social media was disbelief. <laughs> and, right. and I gradually saw the utility as a communications method. Now, as an evangelist, the state of the art of evangelism in 1984 was you had a you had a car with a gasoline engine that you could drive to developers or you got an airplane ticket 
or you had a cell phone. No, not even. You had a copper-based no. phone. No, well, maybe you had one of those bag phones. You might have had a bag oh, phone yeah. at that point. A Motorola brick. Or, or if you were really right. cool, you had a fax machine, right? So you flew there, you drove there, you called there, or you faxed there. And now with social media, you can reach anybody in the world, well, except in Russia, you can reach anybody in the world immediately, basically for free. And, you know, could we have done this interview back in 1983? Well, one of us would have had to travel to the other person, and then we would stick our cassette tape in a dual-headed recorder, <laughs> and off we go. So I think social media is the best thing that ever happened to marketing and evangelism and sales. Now, obviously, bad things have happened, too. But, you know, no technology is purely good. I mean, think of all the bad things that have happened with computing um, and, and, you know, all the evil that has happened with computers, too. But, I mean, on balance, would you want to go back to that age where the state of the art is a fax machine? That's right. That's exactly it. So, all right. So it sounds like you were... A, you know, you, you, you saw it later, which is fine. So as we, as the, my, my last question is, let's talk forward then, um, which is, so social media is something obviously that you, you were able to harness and, you know, really grow from a, you know, you had this amazing kind of professional career and now grow it to this, you know, amazing uh, advisor, hands-on chief evangelist work too. Um, what's the future? Like, you know, for you, whenever you, like, what are the things that get you excited? You know, obviously you're on this, you know, chief evangelist for Canva that is literally yeah. like the hockey stick's not even the right. It's more like a straight line up, <laughs> right? Um, what, what, are, what are you excited about? <laughs> well, <laughs> listen, I, I'm 67 years old. And so uh, this is the tail end of my career. And um, I have to tell you that I think I'm doing the best work of my career. And the, and the best work of my career is my podcast. So I feel like all, everything it's I've amazing. done up to this point yeah, has prepared me for this moment where I have the visibility. And I may not know everybody, but enough people know of me so that they think I'm credible enough to get on my podcast. Like, if you had told me a few years ago that I could get Jane Goodall and Neil deGrasse Tyson to be on my podcast, I would have laughed at you. So just because of, I don't know, whatever, good luck, I've been able to get great guests. I have had a very good view into what's happened in technology, and I have a very curious mind. It's slipping, but it's still curious. And so, um, you know, I, I basically with my podcast, I am on a mission to make people remarkable. And so I interview remarkable people to get their wisdom to help other people become remarkable. And, you know, I, love it. I may not have as many listeners as Joe Rogan, but and it may take my death for people to truly appreciate my podcast, but it's the best work I've ever done. I love it. And it's an, it is amazing. If you all don't, if you all haven't tuned in, we'll obviously link to it in the show notes. Um, but it really is an amazing storytelling podcast, um, as well that I really, I really enjoy. Uh, so I'm glad you're putting it out in the universe. So guy, I want to say, look, this is a lot of fun, right? And we'll, we'll probably, I want to leave, we'll leave a little bit about, um, of the break where you had your carpet delivered um, as, as a part of life, right? And I'll do the same thing because, like I said, I, it was so funny. We were talking about this where I literally had – I had to do the exact same thing a few days ago. And so it just – it is what it is. We'll see. I'll think about that part. But but for clean, a clean exit here. So, Guy, I really want to thank you for joining me today. This was a lot of fun. I think hopefully people got to, to learn a little bit about your story the lessons, you know, that you took throughout your life. And there's a lot of different themes, you know, I think people will pull around, you know, doing different things, trying different things, aligning to yes. your passions and the things that you're, that you're, that you're good at. And that the, the last point I think is one of those important points, which is whether you're 30, 40, 50, 60, it's never too late to reinvent yourself. You never know what the no. next big thing is going to be. And, yep. and where you're at today is not where you might end up. And so well, keep doing the things I, that you love and enjoy, and it works out. Can I give you one last 
story to cap that oh, off. Oh, my. You can give a million. Yes. <laughs> so I want your listeners to know that at the age of 60, I took up surfing for the first time. And let's just say that's about 55 years too late. And I tell you this story, <laughs> not, not to brag about my athletic prowess, because I'm not a good surfer, but if I can take up surfing at 60, basically, you can take up anything at any age. And that's the message. I love it. Don't forget, you t- didn't you take up hockey at, like in your 40s, too? Wasn't uh, that yeah, the- that was when I was a young babe. Yeah, so I I had never <laughs> ice skated, and I took up hockey at forty four. I took up surfing at sixty. I I tend to take up the things that my I kids are it. interested in. Now, one of my sons is into wingsuiting, and I will not be taking that up. Oh no. No, 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 no. That okay. seems terrifying, but no, I I love that final point. It's a great one to end on. And and again, guy, thank you so much for joining me it's today. Truly, I, I I love being on people's podcasts where now you have to edit out everything, not me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, everyone. Okay. Thank you again, Take guy. Care. We'll see you next Bye. week on the Jake Don Lab Show. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to another extremely fun and interesting episode. I thought it was fun and interesting, so I hope you did too of the Jake Dunlap Show. Uh, Really great just breaking down everything that makes people who they are, the success, the trials and errors, and I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Make sure to subscribe on your favorite platform and make sure more than anything to go over to jakedunlap.com. That's where you're going to stay up to date on all the latest guests, additional details, prep notes. We're going to be sharing everything on jakedunlap.com. So go ahead, go over there. You can subscribe there as well too. And we will see you next week on the Jake Dunlap Show.